All right, we're letting people in right now. We've got a special song for everyone, the Rita Coolidge all-time high theme song from the James Bond film. Please enjoy it while we uh, wait for all the participants to join up. Hundreds of people are jumping in at the moment, so just hang tight. All right, for those of you joining us, we'll be starting in just uh, 30 seconds or so. Gonna wait just a few more seconds and then we'll get going. Thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, great. Um, we'll get started here. Welcome everyone. We have participants uh, from all over the world uh, joining us today and we're live streaming on Facebook. Uh, we'll also upload this monthly market uh, update uh, onto YouTube and you'll be able to watch it uh, later if you can't get to the whole thing today. Um, we have so much exciting uh, news to share. It's been a very um, impassioned month in the cryptocurrency community and uh, we have a really special guest today as well. So without further ado, um, my name is Nicholas Carey. I'm the co-founder of blockchain.com, the founding commissioner of the Blockchain Commission for Sustainable Development and I wrote an, art, an article called The Future is Decentralized. So um, today, uh, we're really excited to share a whole bunch of things with you. Um, we're calling this the all-time high and what happens after the all-time high. So um, for those that uh, didn't know, um, the all-time high of crypto uh, previously um, was uh, set in 2017 uh, on December 17th uh, when the Bitstamp exchange reached 19,666 and on uh, November 30th, um, we reached a new all-time high on the blockchain.com exchange of 19,864. So really exciting stuff there. Um, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, blockchain.com. For those of you that don't know, um, blockchain.com is on a mission. Uh, we believe in creating a financial system for the internet that empowers anyone in the world to control their money. So we want to build software that makes it easier for all people, uh, regardless of the circumstance of their birth, to be able to send, receive, secure, trade, and exchange digital forms of money. And it's been a really intense 30 days for us. Um, we have actually had more people sign up over the past 30 days than any 30 day period of time uh, for the company. So lots of updates for you soon. But um, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, for those of you that don't know, blockchain.com is the world's most popular non-custodial wallet. Um, and so you can sign up for free and get started today. Uh, there's an iOS, Android app and a web experience. Um, if you're on mobile, make sure you keep those apps updated. We've uh, been shipping lots of stuff for you there. Uh, we also have the blockchain.com exchange. This is a professional trading venue uh, with uh, most exciting crypto pairs. Um, very fast liquid exchange. So for those of you that are a little more advanced, uh, feel free to pop into that. The blockchain.com explorer is primarily used um, by members of the press, media, and academia that want to study and search the uh, open ledger um, blockchains. And we have lots of charts and pricing information in there. It's a great place to sort of start to discover the activity that's happening um, on these networks. Really exciting. We have a feature that allows you to pledge uh, your crypto and borrow uh, collateral if you need to. We have a feature that makes it really easy to buy crypto for the first time. And we recently launched interest accounts where you deposit your crypto and earn interest. Um, we have a large institutional lending operation and we split the fees that we earn from the interest there uh, with our customers that deposit um, into our interest feature. And then finally, for the nerds out there, blockchain.com is a great API available uh, for all the developers and software engineers that want to build stuff on top of our platform. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the team has been really busy. Um, so what's new at blockchain.com? First of all, uh, we've launched an even faster and simpler swap experience. So you can trade into and out of your different crypto assets within your wallet um, with greater ease than at any point uh, before. We've also launched a really exciting feature uh, called uh, Wrapped Digital Gold. Um, this was something a lot of people were asking for. Uh, basically, um, it's an actual gold product um, that's a Ethereum token, so you can trade it and move it off the platform if you want to. It's now available both in the wallet and the exchange. Uh, so a lot of us got into crypto because of sound money economics um, and uh, some people called Bitcoin digital gold. This is an actual gold um, tokenized product. Very interesting. Um, you can explore that in the wallet. We've also launched Bitcoin Cash and uh, Stellar interest um, features uh, in the wallet. So if you hold either of those assets, you can deposit those or an interest on them now. Um, we've also launched full availability in Pennsylvania, um, which is really exciting if you live in that state. 
The simple buy widget on the blockchain.com explorer is now live. Um, we've added interest features in the Android wallet. And um, for those of you that haven't been following the blockchain.com podcast, which uh, heavily features Garrick, uh, who will be joining us in just a moment, um, is available um, on all your favorite streaming platforms. Uh, so please sign up for that. Um, he is doing a ton of content right now and regularly being asked uh, to join all kinds of press events. So um, if you want to get kind of current news and great insights, uh, please join the blockchain.com podcast and subscribe to that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a picture of our uh, beautiful wallet. So again, free for everybody. Um, welcome everyone to sign up, keep those things current. Um, we've also uh, launched on the exchange um, updated features uh, for simple trading, which is the view you'll see here on the next slide. Um, and then uh, the current rates for interest um, as well uh, are published at the uh, beginning of every single month. So if you're counting on those, um, you can always keep up uh, date with what's happening on our blog. And then um, <clears throat> next slide, please. This is the uh, simple trade feature we recently launched on the blockchain.com exchange. It's a dead easy way uh, to test out trying new different cryptocurrencies and learning more about them. You can discover um, different assets uh, that have been um, introduced to the market here. And we would love to have you try this feature out on the blockchain.com exchange. Okay, so last time we spoke, we did a market outlook talking about what was happening. Um, we dug into uh, Bitcoin on-chain insights. Um, for those of you that don't know, blockchain.com is responsible for roughly one third of worldwide on-chain transactions. So we got a really uh, interesting ability to study what's going on on these chains. And um, we also then spoke with Sam Harrison, the managing partner of blockchain.com ventures, whose full-time job and career is to study the different protocol projects, the companies that are supporting those um, and make investments. So uh, really great insights from an expert in the field. Um, and we welcome Sam uh, last month. So without further ado, today's focus, we're gonna again uh, cover what's going on in the market. There's just been too much activity, uh, not to concentrate on that a bit. Um, our Bitcoin archeologists have looked at the blockchain and have pulled out a bunch of on-chain insights. And uh, I'm really excited to announce a special guest, uh, Peter Van uh, Valkenberg, the Director of Research at Coin Center is joining us um, from Washington, DC. Um, so uh, Peter has a very important vantage uh, into what's going on on the Hill and um, a lot of the policy making that's happening there. You should definitely follow him on Twitter um, at Balkenberg on the Twitter handle. Okay, um, so moving on next. Um, I'm gonna pass this off uh, to Dr. Garrick Heilman. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce him today. Uh, Dr. Garrick Heilman is the head of research here at blockchain.com and one of the world's most cited cryptocurrency and blockchain researchers. Uh, he created and taught the first UK curriculum on blockchain technology at the University of Cambridge and has authored leading research on cryptocurrencies, markets, stable coins, and broader trends in tech. Uh, he's been ranked as one of the most influential economists in the United Kingdom and is regularly asked to share his research and perspective with government organizations and has been quoted recently in the FT, BBC, CNBC, Wall Street Journal, NPR, and many more. Um, so without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Gary Cowan. Great, thanks so much, Nick. Well, what an incredible uh, month here in November. I mean, there's so much that happened. I don't know if it's just... Oh, can you hear me okay, Nick? Give me a thumbs up, I can see you. Uh... Yep, okay, good, thanks, thanks everybody. So November was an extraordinary month and uh, there's actually just too much to really go through to, to summarize all the amazing kind of strength to strength kind of activities and news from the month, but just a few highlights. You had, um, you know, uh, BlackRock CIO Rick Reeder come on and say that he thought Bitcoin could potentially uh, take the place of gold. Uh, Stanley Druckenmiller, one of the legendary hedge fund managers, announced that he had a Bitcoin position. Um, incredible announcements from, um, from uh, Square in terms of, you know, their, their Bitcoin revenues. Um, you know, on and on and on. So if anyone's asking you why the price of crypto is up, you can just, I think uh, Travis Kling suggested, just send them this, uh, this list here uh, of, of things. Um, moving into uh, the actual numbers. So Bitcoin had its, its best, best month of the year, uh, up 43% in, in November. Ethereum continued to outperform up 57%. And you can see year to date that both are doing really well. Bitcoin plus 173, Ethereum though uh, even, even better, up plus 373% for the year. Um, I think one thing that was really interesting is, is, is what's happening with the price of gold. 
relative to what's happening with, with crypto assets like Bitcoin um, that are also considered to be an inflation hedge or a hedge against um, you know, expansive monetary and fiscal policies. And you saw a real decoupling uh, this, this month with gold down 5% uh, for the month compared to Bitcoin's 43% uh, increase. Uh, we also saw the dollar continue its slide. It kind of held some ground last month, but it was down 2%. Uh, stock market continued to have a great, great month, plus 11. Uh, bonds rallied a bit, up 2%. Uh, but you can see that the, the real losers last month were both gold and the U.S. dollar. And just putting the, uh, the month in perspective for crypto, it was, on average, the best uh, month in, in history for crypto prices. Bitcoin uh, averaged $16,475 during the month of November, which was better than its average price during the, uh, the previous uh, all-time high month, December 2017. You can see also that three of the best, uh, three of the top five best average months for, for Bitcoin have occurred now uh, in the past few months here in 2020 as well. So one, um, just coming back to the gold story, uh, and, and this is something we've published on, you know, the, the digital gold thesis, I think, is something that's easier for people to wrap their heads around for traditional investors to kind of understand. Uh, we published a, a blog piece that we also converted into a podcast uh, talking about why Bitcoin is the hardest asset in history, the irony of a virtual asset being the hardest asset in history. And in November was really quite interesting. You could see there were gold outflows from ETFs while Bitcoin's price was, was rocketing up. So, you know, too early probably to say that we're seeing a repeat of say what Netflix did to Blockbuster, but just even the fact that that idea is starting to enter into people's consciousness and, and gold investors, and there's a lot of them around the world, are starting to wonder uh, whether gold will be less favored going forward as a hard asset will, will really, I think, force a lot of investors to maybe have to reallocate some of their, 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 gold, ass, their gold positioning uh, into something like Bitcoin. So that's, that's an incredibly, incredibly bullish development um, uh, as, that, as that, that meme or that thesis starts to take hold. Um, you know, the other thing that we're watching uh, closely is institutional adoption, and we'll get more into some of the some of the on-chain metrics in the next section that suggests that a lot of the price action is being driven by uh, institutions or high net worth individuals, uh, hedge funds, family offices, and so on. The Stanley Druckenmiller, so to speak, um, one measure that's that partially reflects this, although retail can continue to participate in this, this as well as the Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust, which has gone parabolic uh, here in 2020 with now over 10 billion uh, in assets uh, uh, under, under in the investment trust and uh, over a half a million Bitcoins, uh, the equivalent of half a million Bitcoins uh, represented by the investment trust. Uh, that's an incredibly interesting phenomenon. And I'm looking forward to talking to Peter about uh, this phenomenon, because, you know, especially for the retail investors who are not accredited, there is traditionally been a premium that you're paying over spot price to purchase GBTC and some of the other investment trust products. And the SEC must be looking at this and thinking, boy, retail is not getting a very good deal. I uh, would love to get Peter's comments on what the rise of GBTC and, and the Ethereum and other investment trusts mean for the possibility of, of a, an SEC approved ETF, which um, perhaps might have better pricing for retail customers. Um, but really just to, to wrap up, you know, Nick was playing the all-time high uh, soundtrack uh, to start this month off. I mean, it's important, I think, for people who've been in the crypto space for a long time to, to recognize a great month and celebrate. There's a lot of uh, slow months, slow years even, um, where, you know, it feels like you're taking on the world and, and losing. This is a month where really it felt like we were taking on the world and winning. A lot of the longtime critics of cryptocurrency, people like Nouriel Roubini, uh, Isabella Kaminska, the FT, uh, you know, even Tyler Cowen, uh, an economist from George Mason, uh, came out with with more measured, positive comments. Uh, so it was uh, it was quite a month, and uh, everyone should uh, should feel good about um, the the work that's gone into getting crypto, uh, you know, more established, more recognized, and and really. Um, defeating some of the, the, the most vocal critics out there. Okay, so moving on to on-chain insights, and then we'll get to our conversation with Peter. Um, we saw an uptick in, in on-chain activity uh, last month uh, that coincided with, with uh, the increase in market cap, number of transactions up almost 2%, uh, 
Uh, daily number of active addresses up almost 10%, slight decrease in the share of transactions that were um, leveraging the blockchain.com wallet down from 36 uh, sorry down to 36% from 36.2 uh, but a, but a strong strong month we did see fees of course uh, tick up a bit as well in November over October uh, coinciding with that increased activity now one thing uh, and this speaks to this 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 thesis that we think this is more of an institutional led um, uh, rally in the price of Bitcoin uh, when we look at the mempool or the memory pool, and for those not familiar with this, this is you can think of as kind of the waiting room of transactions that have been initiated but have not yet been confirmed by the and added to the blockchain. It's kind of a holding tank of, of transactions. You know, traditionally, and this is a picture of 2017, we saw an increase in the memory pool size, the number of transactions waiting to be confirmed, or traffic is another way to think about it, coinciding with an increase in the price uh, that year. But this year, that has not uh, played out as, as, you know, with as tight a correlation as we saw then. And so that, to me, suggests that there might be, uh, you know, more kind of off-chain price action really driving this on things like the Chicago's futures markets. And we've seen uh, a big increase in, in activity uh, on the Chicago's futures markets uh, and elsewhere where institutional money might be uh, playing more. Um, so, so that's something to kind of keep an eye on. I guess the takeaway is we, with, with institutional money driving, you know, maybe the recent price action, there's still room for retail maybe to get off the sidelines and come back into crypto. Uh, and, and, and we would expect to see things like the mempool increase uh, more as, as that starts to happen. Okay, so without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we're now to the main event here to chat with the esteemed Peter Van Valkenburg from Coin Center. Just a brief uh, personal note, Peter and I um, actually uh, go, go back a bit. We, uh, Nick mentioned some of the research I've done. One of the earlier reports, earliest reports I did was a report with Peter and Jerry Brito from Coin Center back in 2015. Lloyds of London uh, was getting questions from some of their customers about uh, insuring this thing called Bitcoin. And, and so they hired some guys come in and write a report. So I had the, the pleasure of kind of co-authoring uh, a, a vintage Bitcoin research report with Peter and Jerry from 2015. It's out there somewhere. The if you want to go look at some early vintage Bitcoin research, I think I think Peter's section explaining very clearly how Bitcoin works uh, probably holds up better than, than, than mine. But uh, Peter, welcome to the to the uh, the webinar. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me, Garrick. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> now we're glad to get the, the band back together. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'll ask the first question, then I'm really going to hand it off to Garrick here. Um, we have a little tradition here, um, Peter, uh, when we onboard new teammates and uh, they introduce themselves to the company, we ask them how they earn their first buck. And uh, when I ask that question of you, how, was the, how did you earn your first dollar, pound, euro, uh, or peso? Yeah, so, so my, my first like attempt at a career was was acting. I, I was in New York City. I went to an acting conservatory and I, I just auditioned a bunch and got into a couple off off Broadway things that were terrible. But my first buck, my first dollar earned was actually at my mother's preschool uh, summer camp uh, where I would, you know, in between uh, years of high school, help do camp counseling for preschoolers, which was good preparation actually for uh, working with government. Love it. Thank you very much. So uh, for those that don't know, um, Peter uh, heads research at Coin Center in Washington, DC. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Coin Center's mission and um, also describe what your role is there? Yeah, so like I said, I work with, I work with government. Um, Coin Center has been around now for six years. Uh, that paper we co-authored with Garrick um, for Lloyd's was one of the first things we published. Our mission is to be an educational and policy research resource for people in government who are thinking about how to regulate or whether to regulate uh, cryptocurrencies or how cryptocurrencies fit into existing regulations like say anti-money laundering policy. And you know we're not, uh, we're not like a trade association. There are a couple of trade associations in the crypto space. Um, Coin Center is more like a civil liberties nonprofit. We don't represent any companies, although Companies like blockchain uh, have actually supported us um, very generously, and that's what keeps our doors open. But we don't represent blockchain. We don't represent Coinbase. We don't represent anyone uh, specifically. We represent the technology itself and 
an individual people's right to use the technology. So just like the Electronic Frontier Foundation is an important voice to defend the internet, Coin Center is an important voice to defend the open crypto networks built on top of the, uh, the internet. Thank you. Uh, Garrett, I'll hand it off to you. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, Peter, I think maybe a good place to start, you know, we've had some breaking regulatory developments, which we'll get to here um, around stable coins. But I, I think for our audience, I think a really nice place to start might be with the, um, you know, the noise that's been coming out around uh, non-custodial wallets or what are sometimes referred to as self-hosted or mm -hmm. unhosted. Uh, the U.S. is, uh, I, you know, come up with its own term as the U.S. often does, uh, likes to be a little bit different. Would love to hear your thoughts on whether there's any significance to that that un i've heard some chatter online about that that says something about the us's stance here but can you just um first of all i think a lot of people still are are you know new to crypto and what is an unhosted wallet or or self custody wallet and what is the latest uh state of play around regulating these these wallets like the blockchain.com non-custodial wallet okay so so i mean in a nutshell, a self-hosted wallet or an unhosted wallet is just a wallet. Um, Coinbase has wallet software that they're running on their servers that hold all of their customers' Bitcoin. And I could personally run a wallet on my cell phone that holds just mine. And a company like blockchain.com, I mean, you guys can speak for yourselves, but is an excellent company for manufacturing and creating software so that if you want to run it on your own phone, instead of trusting a company to run it on servers, you can run your own wallet, hold your own Bitcoin or your other crypto assets. Um, so they're all just wallets, but you know, in regulatory circles, we traditionally regulate intermediaries who hold other people's valuables. So we regulate banks who take dollar deposits. We regulate money transmitters who promise to move your money from point A to point B and hold it in between. And we regulate them for various purposes, whether that's anti-money laundering regulation so that those intermediaries aren't um, the channels through which criminals move money, um, or we regulate them for consumer protection purposes so that those intermediaries don't defraud their customers and run away with the funds. But we traditionally regulate intermediaries for these purposes and not individuals. So this distinction between a company holding your Bitcoin as an intermediary, like Coinbase does, versus a so-called self-hosted or unhosted wallet where I'm holding my own, maybe using software from a company, but the company doesn't hold my Bitcoin, is important for a regulatory conversation. Because we're probably, and to give it away, since 2013, we are definitely going to regulate Bitcoin intermediaries like we regulate PayPal or Venmo or any other intermediary. But we're not going to regulate individuals holding their own Bitcoin any more than we'd try to regulate, say, somebody who just happens to have dollars in a mattress under their bed as a financial institution. That, that wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't be good for civil liberties. And nor are we going to regulate, say, the manufacturer of a safe like we would regulate a bank. And so blockchain and others out there um, who create software that allow people to hold their own Bitcoin are really like safe manufacturers. And we don't hold safe manufacturers liable for weird stuff that people choose to put in their safes. And we shouldn't do the same um, with respect to cryptocurrencies. So in a nutshell, that's why this is an important distinction for policymakers is if only just to make sure that policymakers know that intermediaries in the crypto space, so-called hosted wallet providers, fair game for regulation, but the manufacturers of self-hosted wallet software or the people hosting their own Bitcoin are probably not fair game for the typical heavy duty financial institutional regulation that we would impose on intermediaries. As far as terminology, you know, unhosted versus self-hosted, as I said, this is mostly just a functional distinction that needs to be made. So we know that we're only regulating the hosted ones. What we call the not hosted ones is less important. I think it's true that using the term unhosted sounds a little pejorative. It's like, oh, why would you want an unhosted wallet when it could be hosted? It's unhosted. So self-hosted is kind of, it, it speaks more to what's really going on here, which is it's not that there's just no one hosting this thing. It's that an American citizen is hosting this thing, as is their God-given right to own stuff, you know? So I like self-hosted, but we could also just say that they're all wallets. But for regulatory purposes, as I explained, 
some wallets are going to be regulated differently because they're people holding other people's money. Great. That was, uh, that was excellent and uh, very helpful analogies around like uh, the safe manufacturers and, and people putting with weird things into them and, and so on. Um, so I guess the next um, topic that I wanted to get to uh, was this breaking news around uh, stable coins. And, and we've seen a lot of action with the stable coin space. I've published research in recent years on, on this topic. Um, relates to central bank digital currency, what's going on with the now um, Diem name project and, and, and formerly Libra, the Facebook-led initiative to, to launch a global stablecoin. Um, wh what's your take on this breaking stable act? Is this, does this have legs? Uh, you know, there's a lot of chatter on Twitter about you know, node operators potentially running into trouble by, by performing banking services. Can you kind of explain what's happening here with this act and, and where this might go. Yeah. So, so just, you know, I'm, I'm not coin centers director of government outreach. Um, there's a great woman, Robin Weissman, who you could have on at some point to talk about the political prospects of something like this. Cause she's been working on the Hill for big companies like NASDAQ before working with us since forever. Um, she probably won't like that. I said since forever, um, but <laughs> she's been around, she knows, how the hill works. So she's the right person. If I was to offer just a cursory analysis of that, um, look, most legislation that's been introduced this year and in any year doesn't pass. And this is legislation coming from uh, a member who is inarguably on sort of the left of the Democratic Party and not necessarily in the mainstream of the Democratic Party at the moment. Um, the Democrats control the House. So if Chairman Waters of uh, House Financial Services ends up signing onto this thing or, or thinks that it's okay, then maybe it'll get a hearing, but it might not even get a hearing. Uh, if it goes to a hearing, then maybe it goes to a you know committee vote. If it goes to a committee vote, it's gonna be tough because you gotta get a lot of people on board. If it goes to the House, it's gonna be tough because you gotta get a lot of people on board, but it would ultimately have to go to the Senate and the Senate is still held by the Republicans. So barring some substantial shifts in the political landscape, I would say this does not have um, particular legs right now as far as something that's likely to be law within the next year or two years even. Great. And then what does it do? Um, yes. So in short, it effectively bans stable coins. Um, now it doesn't say that it says, uh, that we only want things that are referred to as stable coins or things that are referred to as dollars, um, digital dollars or USDC is a, you know, you know, as a dollar in the name. These things should only be issued, says this, this piece of legislation by federally insured banks, by Fed member banks, really. And so none of the companies that currently issue stable coins, whether they're Coinbase and, and Circle with USDC or Gemini dollars um, from, from uh, the Winklevoss twins, or even the decentralized stable coins, of course, which come from smart contracts on Ethereum like Maker, none of these are issued by federally insured banks. And so they would be, according to this law, if it was to be this bill, if it was to become law, not permitted. You would not be permitted to issue those things. If you are the issuer, you would not be permitted really to pass or transact in those things. Um, and that's pretty heavy handed because there are no federal banks that currently do issue stable coins. So it would basically say there's no more stable coins until a, a federal bank decides to issue one, which might never happen because what's, what's in it for the banks. And the worst part of the problem here is, as you said, this question of whether Ethereum node operators would be subject to liability, quite possibly. So the bill's expansively drafted to say that, look, even if you're just validating transactions that are related to a stable coin, so even if you're just validating the Ethereum blockchain and some of the blockchain content at any particular moment is a smart contract related to DAI or some other stable coin, that is not, per not, not permitted. Um, and if it's not permitted, then it's not permitted to run the Ethereum client in the US. And that's radical. That's the kind of radical regulation of cryptocurrencies that we've been on the lookout for for a long time because they crush innovation and they destroy civil liberties. It would literally require midnight raids into people's homes to make sure that their computer is not connecting to the Ethereum network and validating transactions. 
Uh, th that's not American. Um, so I think the concerns about this bill are, are, are very legitimate. I would never want to see this become law. I also don't think it has much likelihood of becoming law in the near future, though. So we don't necessarily need to panic. We just need to be very um, frank with our criticisms, criticisms of it and why it's bad for innovation and why it's bad for the US and for individuals who just want to use these innovative technologies. And there's, a, there's, a, there's one final wrinkle that I think is worth pointing out about this bill, because this bill has perhaps noble um, ends. It says that, look, people who think they're holding a dollar should have the assurances of federal insurance to know that there really is money backing that and that it won't disappear, right? But there's something very strange about this piece of legislation, if that's the objective. It doesn't apply to things like PayPal or Venmo, which are, you know, digital money that's issued by a non-bank. So this bill would only outlaw digital money issued by a non-bank if it is a quote unquote stable coin, not if it's Western Union or PayPal or Venmo or any of these other things or Apple or Google Pay. So to me, that's very odd. Like if you really care about people's you know, safety of their deposits, why are you just targeting stable coins, which are a relatively small fraction of all the non-bank dollars out there? And I think maybe the cynical answer is because it's easy to pick on a small industry, like the nascent stable coin industry compared to the more traditional non-banking financial sector. And maybe it's actually supposed to apply to all those companies by looking at a broad meaning of the definition of stable coins, in which case it's sort of a Trojan horse uh, piece of legislation, which is a little odd. Interesting. Well, that sets up, uh, I think, nicely the next question on, on central bank digital currencies and, and this point you raise about kind of the objectives and whether the legislation really meets the political objectives or is there a disconnect one of the things I've wondered about with regards to central bank digital currencies, the U.S. digital dollar, and one of the sponsors of the Stable Act sponsored some legislation in March around introducing um, a U.S. digital dollar in a more account-based type system. So taking the Federal Reserve's existing account system, kind of expanding that to allow everyday retail users like ourselves access to a bank account, in essence, at the Fed. My question, Peter, was do you think um, some of these questions, these design questions around things like a US digital dollar are going to be made at the congressional or political level outside of kind of the technocratic level. You know, for example, how much privacy should a US digital dollar have? That's something that has to be kind of dealt with at the political level, uh, not at the Brian Brooks or Federal Reserve level. And, and what, I mean, should we be concerned if there is this big kind of technical literacy gap uh, that we've often seen, sadly, in Congress, uh, if I can say that, without offending too many people, uh, where, where maybe there's an intention to do something that has a noble intention, as you mentioned, but there's a disconnect between that intention and what's actually proposed as legislation. Um, any, any thoughts on, on all that? So I'd say, first pass, I think it's right that these things get settled on the political level rather than the administrative level. Um, the administrative state, which is, you know, all of the multi-lettered agencies that we, we think of, like the OCC, FinCEN, the SEC, these are not lawmakers. They shouldn't be lawmakers. These are not elected people. These are people appointed by an elected president, um, but they are the not themselves elected by the, by the public. So they shouldn't be making consequential judgments about law and policy. They should just be taking the will of Congress and enforcing it and enacting it. That's the way our constitutional system is supposed to work, that the elected representatives actually get to set policy. So I think it would actually be better if decisions about something as important as, you know, a future form for our national currency are made by Congress and not by arbitrary persons within any particular administration, whether it's the current Trump administration or future Biden administration or other administrations. That's how democracy is supposed to work. Now you're right, Congress doesn't always have the technical chops to make these harder decisions with respect to technologies and, and economic systems because these are complex things where you need specialist knowledge and Congress people are generalists because they have to deal with all of government. 
I mean, that's where organizations like Coin Center come in, is to come in and educate an office. And you'd be surprised. Um, it varies office to office. But in a lot of offices that we've had a lot of contact with in Congress, there's at least one staff member, sometimes high ranking staff member for the Congress person, who's extremely well educated on this stuff and really actually is kind of a fan or cares about the technology. And you mentioned this CBDC um, proposed uh, legislation. I don't know if it ever, it didn't ever get introduced, but there was some draft language floating around, who, which was uh, from, I believe, uh, Congresswoman Talib's office, just like um, uh, this Stable Act is, is coming out of her office as well. And actually to give Congresswoman Talib credit, because um, obviously I was a little harsh about the Stable Act, which I think has problems, uh, the proposal that CBDC I thought was actually very good from her office. Um, it had a, a section which directed Treasury to figure out how to issue an actually private bearer instrument like digital dollar, which is like, you know, Zcash or Monero or, or, or Bitcoin with, with mixing. Like, that's great. That is what a digital dollar should be. We don't want the digital dollar to be a surveillance tool with a public blockchain or a permissioned closed blockchain that's nonetheless transparent to everybody in government, because then all of your day to day transactions are suddenly, you know, searched and seized, if you will, without a warrant. Um, so I think Congresswoman Tlaib had the right idea with the CBDC um, legislation that she was she was drafting. Um, and maybe not the right idea with this uh, stable act. Um, but these are complicated issues. And it's evolving, as I said. Great. On that note, uh, you mentioned Monero and Zcash. I think one of the more uh, surprising things that uh, didn't get a lot of attention in the in the media. I know Jerry commented on this in in uh, you know on Twitter when he saw this was uh, the the disclosure by the Justice Department that some of these cryptocurrencies with a you'll have to help me with the terminology enhanced privacy is, is that the the I correct they've, term? They've they've settled recently on anonymity enhanced crypto. So AECs. AEC, yeah, great. Another another three letter <laughs> anonymity enhanced crypto and, and Monero and Zcash kind of fitting that definition that those coins, when they're seized by the US government, are not resold or auctioned off like Bitcoin has historically have since you know the early days of the first Silk Road seizures. And there was another seizure uh, recently of almost 70,000 coins, I believe. I, I assume the government's planning to auction those off as well. But I thought that was really an interesting disclosure. Uh, there was, of course, a lot of missing information. We don't know how much you know Monero or Zcash or one or both or more uh, of these coins the government is holding. But it sounds like they're holding at least some. And, and uh, the fact that they were distinguishing uh, those coins from Bitcoin and, and other crypto assets, I think was quite interesting. Can you comment on that? Has there been any more that we've learned since, since that was mentioned? And, and, and what's your take on this kind of somewhat startling and maybe a little concerning development? I mean, it's just bizarre to me. I don't, I don't, um, <laughs> so it's, 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 it, you know, when, when there's civil asset forfeiture and there's assets that are seized that are actually like illegal or shouldn't be trafficked in, like, um, you know, guns that, that shouldn't be owned um, by individuals in the US, uh, they destroy firearms in mass, uh, which is kind of interesting rather than selling them back into circulation. Um, probably some nice historic ones too. It's kind of, I'm not a, I'm not a big gun person myself, but that seems kind of like you actually have to like melt down these things or something. What's going on, uh, with crypto. I, you know, I, I don't get it because well, a couple things, one crypto is certainly not illegal. So it's not like you should be obligated to destroy it. You, you just want to stop people from laundering money using it, which you do when you seize it from criminals. And then it's just crypto, it's fungible. It's the same as any other crypto. So why not sell it back to the public? And they do that with Bitcoin. So why would they not do it with Zcash or Monero? I, I, I don't know. Um, maybe it's a, a lack of comfort with using the, the, that wallet software reliably and not screwing it up. Or, you know, there are lots of administrative issues um, potentially involved here with managing crypto and selling it and things like that. Um, I, I, I have trouble speculating as to why. But the other thing that's funny is uh, if you're a fan of crypto economics, 
you don't mind this if you're a Zcash or Monero fan because it's just reducing the supply, right? Which is just going to make it more scarce, which is going to make the price go up, all other things being held equal. So, you know, maybe maybe that's what's going on. Maybe they want to secretly boost the, uh, the price. I think the government is now hodling oh, Monero and Zcash. They're hodling but... <laughs> the oldest strategy in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, how, do you, how do you get that kind of publicity, right? It's like this, this uh, torrenting uh, watch list that's published by the government, I think every year is kind of seen as a great like, you know, marketing tool for, for uh, different BitTorrent websites. Uh, you know, what, what great advertising, you can't buy it, right? Or, or, or like the IRS is, hey, here's a bounty to crack uh, Monero. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> this advertisement for Monero paid by, by, uh, by the Internal Revenue Service. But um, well, that's, I mean, it, it, you know, with, with things like Lightning, I, I don't know if we, how deep in the weeds we want to get into, you know, some of the protocol um, changes to, to Bitcoin in recent years and, and Taproot uh, and, and additional enhancement of, of privacy. Is, is there like a line or a threshold where you would worry or be concerned that somehow Bitcoin kind of crosses over into the, uh, you know, a, uh, is it, sorry, a e a e c. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I hope it does cross over. Um, you know, I I I really like the efforts from the like the Wasabi Wallet guys with coin join transactions, and I love the Taproot ideas. Um, this is important. We can't have a global economic system that's built on a blockchain if anyone can look at the blockchain and figure out your transaction graph history. Uh, we just can't. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's sort of some level of privacy from uh, obscurity with the Bitcoin blockchain because you think like, oh, who's really going to, to, to dig into the blockchain and see my past payment history? But the fact of the matter is there's like extremely lucrative businesses like Chainalysis and Elliptic that make a habit out of selling blockchain analysis, which is de-anonymization, if you will, or, or, or identification. Um, to governments, but also to corporations. So this doesn't have to be some kind of libertarian concern where you're just worried about the government learning about your transactions. This could be just about worrying about corporations learning about your transactions and then targeting you for, say, predatory interest rates because they know you're crypto poor. This is not going to happen now because not everybody's assets are on blockchains. But in a plausible future, most of our assets could be on blockchains, including things like digital dollars. And we can't live in a world then where your entire economic life is for public display. It's just a terrible idea from a you know, threat of totalitarianism standpoint, abuse of corporations with data privacy issues standpoint. It's just bad. So I hope that it switches. Um, I, I feel like your question was suggesting like, are you worried that it switches, Bitcoin becomes more private because then we'd have more regulatory crackdown? Um, I'd have to say no. Um, you know, blockchain analysis, which you can do with Bitcoin that maybe you can't do well with Monero or Zcash is just one tool of several tools that a regulated entity can use to meet their compliance obligations with respect to regulations, with respect to anti-money laundering. And so if it's an incoming Bitcoin transaction to a hosted wallet, like a Coinbase wallet, they have to maybe do a little blockchain analysis to make sure that it's not coming straight from the Silk Road or something like that. But that's not the only way that they can stop money laundering. You know, banks accept cash, you know, at a window. Cash never has any blockchain record of its past transactions, kind of like Monero or Zcash. And yet banks are allowed to deal in large amounts of cash. Why is that? Well, it's because they have other policies that they put in place. Um, they can't do blockchain analysis, obviously, because it's physical cash, but they can do heightened due diligence. They'll ask for more identification from the person who's showing up at their window with cash. They'll ask uh, for proof of where they got the cash, like it's from my wages here, look at this tax form from my employer, something like that. And they'll do other, they'll do other things, like if it's a large enough cash transaction, they'll file a currency transaction report with FinCEN that just says, look, this is a big cash transaction from our customer. We don't know where it's going, but you should know what's happening. Um, these are all completely valid ways of complying with the Bank Secrecy Act, which is our anti-money laundering law in the US. And nowhere in the BSA does it say you have to do these things and blockchain analysis. So if blockchain analysis suddenly doesn't work well with Bitcoin, which, as I just basically said, I hope it doesn't in the near future, it won't be an existential threat as the laws are currently applied. If there are new laws that come in response to, oh, there's all this money moving around and we can't trace it, well, we'll just have to fight those laws like we'd have to fight, say, the Stable Act um, that we talked about earlier in the program as effectively un-American. 
you know, people have a right to hold their own stuff, own their own stuff and send their own stuff without there being constant government surveillance and always an ability for the government to stop you from transacting as a prior restraint before you're even convicted of a crime. That would not be American. It's very, um, not to be blunt, it's very Chinese. That's the system the Chinese are building with their CBDC, where the government will see every transaction and be able to stop or disconnect any person from the, from the economy at will without law. It's not American. Great. Nick, um, did you want to come back in? I've got one more question I'd love to ask Peter, but I, I don't want to hog. Yeah, I thought um, just sort of a, potentially a bit of more of a generic question, um, but from your vantage, Peter, um, you know, what, what do you see as one of the biggest like success stories from Coin Center's history? And then um, I think what are some things you're looking for in 2021 um, to, you know, what does mainstream adoption sort of need um, from your perspective uh, that you guys can help enable from the conversation you're having on the Hill? I mean, you guys are really doing the tip of the spear's work on educating people that make really important decisions. Um, and so uh, I welcome a little bit of thinking around what the 2021 strategy is going to look like for you guys. Sure. So the first question was sort of biggest uh, success to date for Coin Center. Uh, there, there, I'll, I'll mention two briefly. Um, in the last five years that we've been around, six years that we've been around, there, are, there have been primarily two existential threats to Bitcoin uh, and permissionless blockchain networks. And one would have been overzealous application of US securities law regulations to crypto. Uh, people don't realize, I mean, we saw the ICO boom happen. We saw the SEC go after ICOs, um, especially fraudulent ICOs, where people were taking money on a promise of future profits. That's actually fine. I don't see that as a problem because most ICOs are really just somebody's promise to make profits for somebody. And then maybe they deliver their token and maybe then when the token's delivered, it's not a security and it shouldn't be regulated as a security, but the promise is a security. And so that pre-sale should probably be regulated as a security. But a lot of people don't know that when the SEC first started looking at this technology, just at Bitcoin back in 2014, 2015, when we had a few meetings with their, um, their cross-divisional working group on the subject, it was sort of an open question whether even Bitcoin would fit into the Howey test and could be regulated as a security. Uh, the Howey test is this flexible standard for what is a security. And if Bitcoin had been found by the SEC and later then it would have to be found by a judge to be a security, it would mean it's not allowed to trade anywhere except national securities exchanges, which is like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. It would effectively outlaw all Bitcoin trading because national securities exchanges still to this day don't trade Bitcoin and probably wouldn't. And it would basically destroy American markets in crypto. Um, that didn't happen, I think, at least in part because of our efforts to educate the SEC about why Bitcoin is sufficiently decentralized, i.e. there's miners, there's software developers, there's no one promoter who we rely upon and therefore doesn't fit this Howey test for what is an investment security. And then the other... Um, big victory I think that, I, that we can take some credit for is with respect to anti-money laundering policy. As I said earlier, when we were describing the difference between a hosted wallet and a self-hosted wallet, um, FinCEN, which is the agency that regulates for anti-money laundering purposes, came out in 2013 with guidance that said a Bitcoin exchanger um, is a money transmitter, just like PayPal or Venmo. They have to know their customers and file sus suspicious activity reports. Uh, there's sort of an open question from that point forward well, if it's just me with my own wallet, am I a money transmitter? Or what if I'm a company that provides multi-signature solutions? So like Bitco is probably one of the best known in this space, but I'm sure blockchain does as well, um, where we hold one key for customers, but not sufficient keys to transact using their Bitcoin. Um, they're going to hold their own other keys or things like that. What if you're holding just one of three keys? Are you a money transmitter? And so we wanted to make sure that when FinCEN finally opined on all of these more nuanced questions beyond just Coinbase being a money transmitter, that it would be the right opinion that you're only a money transmitter if you're like Coinbase and have full control over the Bitcoin. You're not a money transmitter if you're holding your own uh, or if you're a company that holds one of three keys in a multi-sig arrangement. And FinCEN came out in May, 2019 and said, Yep, if you don't have independent control over customer Bitcoin, you're not a money transmitter. And so that's exactly the right regulatory settlement. And I think we can take some credit for educating the very good folks at FinCEN um, on how these technologies work and why multi-sig is important and things like that. 
Fantastic. And then as far as what I see as the biggest obstacle to adoption, I mean, there are potential regulatory obstacles in the future. So we started out talking about how there's been rumors about uh, regulation of self-hosted wallets. That would be a huge obstacle if you weren't allowed to hold your own stuff. I'm actually fairly confident that we'll be able to fight those off, um, that the people proposing them are in the minority of government, that actually the majority of government um, often doesn't care enough to, to fight that fight or is actually enthusiastic about the technology. I think the real obstacles to crypto are just getting normal people to feel comfortable using it, you know, and actually using it for payments, not just for speculation and not just for wealth creation. And the fact of the matter is it's still really hard to use a wallet, to use um, Bitcoin for day-to-day -day transactions, let alone to use something private like Zcash or Monero or Bitcoin with privacy, where you're going to need a special wallet like Wasabi wallet. These are really hard tools. They need better user interfaces. It's sort of a long, hard uh, effort amongst developers to just build more intuitive systems so that people want to transact with them and then merchants want to accept them as transactions because they want to accept the payment methods that their customers want to use. It's a really hard problem, maybe even a somewhat intractable, intractable problem. Um, but fortunately, that's not my problem. That's your guys' problem. <laughs> the team of blockchain.com will be diligently working on this list of priorities. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter, uh, for your views and perspective today. Um, I think uh, you're doing the Lord's work over there in Washington. So thank you. Uh, Garrick, I'll leave you the last question. Yeah, I, and I'll just mention also a little advertisement for Coin Center. Um, if you want to support uh, you know, Peter and the work they're doing on, on these, these critical questions, I, I believe you do take individual donations, not just... Oh, yeah. uh, yeah, and About and I, half of our donations actually come from passionate individuals in the Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency space. Yep, absolutely. So go to Coin Center and help support the work uh, uh, that Peter and, and others there are doing. Um, you know, this this last month we we got another one of these kind of um, comments. This this time from Ray Dalio, uh, one of the most successful hedge fund managers in history. You know, if if Bitcoin ever becomes too big, governments will simply ban or or regulate it, I guess, back into being small. Um, you know, I just this this kind of comment comes up from time to time, and it is a something I think that some folks like Ray kind of like fall back on when they think, oh, you know, this is you know, why why should why should I bother with crypto? It just can't be allowed to succeed. I mean, what's your what's your take on a comment like that? You know, um, from a governments uniting, getting together to to in a coordinated way to ban something like this? How would that even work? What, what's your reaction to a comment like that? Yeah, I mean, the, the part that's it's sort of half true, half false, right? The part that's definitely true is, yeah, governments are going to ban it, some governments, and those governments are going to be the geopolitical losers of the 21st century. Are all governments going to get together and systematically ban it? I don't think so, because some maybe minority of governments, maybe it's a majority, will see the inherent value in the technology to enrich their economies and grow their countries and uh, better their citizens. So I, I think of it just like the internet. Like, did China really want the internet to exist? No, it's an existential threat to their ability to control information within their borders. And if you're a repressive or non-democratic state, you need to control information to not lose control of your country. And China's done a pretty decent job, you know, segmenting their internet from the rest of the world, but it's at their own cost, right? Like, I mean, there's lots of prophecies about the ultimate triumph of the Chinese economy globally, but I'd still rather live in the U.S. where we have a free internet and an open internet. And I think longer term, that's better for the U.S. economy and better for the, the hopes of, of, of the United States as a nation. So I think it, it'll be the exact same situation. Some countries will ban permissionless blockchain networks. We've already seen a few try because of capital controls and things like that. Um, and they'll also immediately just be fighting history, uh, which is not going to be good for anyone, but ultimately they'll lose that fight. Great. That's a nice note to wrap up on. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. A very timely discussion with uh, uh, the breaking regulatory developments. And uh, again, please go to Coin Center to check out all their great um, research and publications. We're actually featuring one in our monthly um, publication, uh, a piece on non-custodial wallets that was published recently, we're, we're, we're republishing. 
uh, on our own uh, monthly uh, publication. And um, yeah, uh, Peter, we hope we can have you on again in the future. That was a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Peter. Good night, everyone.